Welcome to Portals of Perception and to What is Healing episode number three. The portal's intuition is that humanity is undergoing a deep process of transformation and that we have actually entered what we describe as an epochal phase shift transition. In this, there is a growing recognition that the shift involves healing, a deep healing of ourselves and healing of the world as we seek to discover anew who we humans are. Now, partnering with me on this series and the inquiry into healing is Alexander Love. And today we have a circle of practitioners, healing practitioners with us. And I'm going to actually ask that we begin by appreciating what is the nature of illness and or sickness. I don't know if you make distinction between these two words. So I'd like to invite that you each briefly introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and your practice. And then that you offer a beginning entry of appreciation in terms of what is sickness, what is illness, and how do you observe in your practice and what do you think about illness? So how about that as, as an opening? Uh, who is ready to uh, get us started? I'm Lori E. Deshar, and I have been practicing um, traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture since 1985, beginning with a five element approach, which had its own emotional focus, psycho-emotional focus. And since then layering on um, many different aspects of what I call alchemical healing, uh, transformational process work from the beginning for me, it was clear that Chinese medicine was much more than fixing people's aches and pains, but rather had the capacity to, to shift consciousness and shift awareness through broadening, you know, going beyond the limitations of modern dualistic mental awareness. And I think the only other thing I want to sort of layer on here is that very soon after I began practicing, I saw the limitations of traditional Chinese medicine in a modern Western context and began studying various forms of psychology, beginning with Gestalt and then a beautiful somatic process I studied with Jean Genlin um, and learned to apply that to psychological process focusing. And then uh, for the past 20, 25 years, I've been deeply engaged in Jungian depth psychology. And my first book, Five Spirits, was an incorporation of Chinese medicine and depth psychology, looking at how to begin to bridge East and West in a modern psychological process. As far as how I would, my little pebble in the pond here, as far as our conversation is, um, a few nights ago, I was leading a retreat on the west coast of, of Mexico by the glorious Pacific. And so much was happening, so much was bubbling in that retreat. And I woke up from a dream in the morning, and the dream was, um, polishing the coal to create the diamond. So I'll drop that image into our question, what is illness and what is healing? Beautiful. Thank you, Lori. Well, my name is Randine Lewis, and I've been practicing Chinese medicine for a few decades now. Most of the work that I've done in Chinese medicine has been in the realm of reproductive health and fertility, and really looking at what is impeding the life force, 
what is getting in the way of the life force coming through. Um, and so I've been, I've been doing a lot of retreats and getting into some deeper psycho-emotional and spiritual issues that individuals have. Um, I've written five books in the field from some having to do with fertility, some having to do with how the life force comes in, some having to do with um, the correlations between birth and death, um, some having to do with integrative medicine, keeping the focus on um, the, the Eastern and Taoist perspective of the philosophy of life. What is life? Who are we? What are we about? Why are we here? And those are the fundamental questions that I think need to be asked, asked and lived more than answered in order to come to our own individual sense of who we are. What does healing represent to each of us? And so with the question, what is illness? What is disease? I, I go back to what the earliest book of Chinese medicine says, that when we are in a state of disease and then illness arises, it asks, where are we? Where have we lost harmony with nature? And where does the error lie? And, and so it opens up this question is, have I lost harmony with nature? Have I lost harmony with myself? Have I lost harmony with the very existence of things? Where is the loss of harmony? So that it, and when you can kind of tune into the subtle, which I think all of us do with our patients is help them tune into some of the more subtle realms. So we're not just paying attention to aches and pains. And it's like, oh, my shoulder hurts. What does that mean? But I'm paying more attention to where do things feel off in me? Where do I not feel harmonized in all of my life, in my body, in my mind, in the relationships of my life, with my environment, with who I am, with who the cosmos is, what the cosmos is. And so as we start feeling into where that disharmony lives, then we're in the place where real healing can happen. So that's my pebble in the pond. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I've been uh, practicing Chinese medicine for a couple decades, and um, I combine Chinese medicine with coaching, and most specifically, um, supporting individuals to look deep within themselves to discover where they're experiencing fragmentation, and then exploring tools to transform that experience of fragmentation into a deeper relationship with wholeness. For, for me, illness, Illness has to do with the myth of separation. Um, it says in, in one of the earlier classical texts that disease is, is caused by wind. Hundreds of diseases are caused by wind. And when we look into the symbolism of that, wind is synonymous with change. Wind is invisible, unexpected, something in which we only see the results we see the doors blow open. We, we, we see the tree branches break or, or dance. And in this world that we're in, where we have these phases of life and death, it can appear as if we are um, separate. As Randine was saying, the diseases are caused when we're out of sync with nature. It can appear as if we're separate. It can appear as if those that we love are lost or the beautiful bloom decays. And, and my experience is that um, illness is caused when we believe in the myth 
of separation, coming back to what Lori was saying around sort of polishing. And, and when we polish enough, we begin to see through the world into something that's continuous, something that ties everything together, the ink that's sort of, that keeps us all whole. And so um, this can happen psychologically and this can also happen physiologically. When our bodies are experiencing that lack of harmony, it's an expression of, to me, it's an expression of separation. And when we can help the body remember its deeper wholeness, or when we can remember, help the, the mind remember its deeper wholeness, um, it creates, it's that polishing that, that sort of uncovers some kind of harmony um, that brings us back to what we're, what we are. So there is a sense in, in each of your pebbles, starter pebbles, that, um, that offers the appreciation that illness or disease is, is the herald of something or the beginning of something or the opening of possibility or the, the awakening or the alerting to the possibility of the, the more of who we can become through the journey of healing. I'd, I'd like to just stay with this a little longer and, and invite one more round of, of comments. In, in your practice, as, as you work with and help people, what are you discovering? that in terms of what is the function or what is the possibility that is emerging when people discover that they have something that they want to address? Pain, illness, disease, whatever it is. I'll pick that one up first. Um, I, I was reminded when Alexander was speaking about wind, the, that the, the classics talk about robber winds, that there are these forces that take us out of ourselves. There are these forces and the, you know, basically it's, it's desire. It's desire for things to be different than they are. It's where we're at odds with our experience of life. And we want things different. We kind of demand things to be different. And, you know, I want a baby. I want not to be ill. I want not to have this discomfort. And so we try to externally change things. And so when, when I'm working with somebody or a group of people that really come to discover that they are at the origin of their own process of disease, that it's not caused by these external forces that come and attack them per se, but they have a role that it can be a little disturbing to them at first to see the immense responsibility that we each have for our own healing process. But then if they claim that, if they root themselves in that and say, wait a minute, all of these robber winds, these things that I'm, these ways that I'm demanding life to be different than it is, are precisely the things that are causing my disharmony. And sometimes it's those that have the deepest issues, the most trauma, the most to overcome those are the ones who do the greatest transformation. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when somebody gets in that state of like really going within and seeing the origin of their own, you know, production of disharmony, that all of a sudden there's this other force that takes over, that overrides these winds. And that power comes through and you can tell that they've been taken into a healing realm because they've been rooted in the strength of who they really are, aligned with the origin, with the Tao.
and miraculous things happen that I could never induce. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's amazing. It's like already there's so much just in these few things that you've all shared. But I mean, I want to begin by saying just in my own experience, you know, having just come off traveling and catching up with life, you know, coming from a place where I felt I was in such a flow by the ocean and with every you know, group of 18 people all engaged in inner work and very serious practitioners all re really ready to go in and then traveling through the airport and opening my computer and not even knowing that I was had lost that center. And then as soon as the we the four these, you know, I saw the three of you felt the heart alignment. I remembered. It is quite amazing. You know, of course, I don't know you of you, but Alexander Randine, it's like we've already created a heart entrainment. So as soon as I see your faces, it's like the geometry of my subtle body, in a sense that diamond geometry, where you know the heart-centered awareness comes back. And really, if I think about what we're doing in the treatment, what I'm doing you know, week after week, I mean, it's been years and years and years of practice. And I still go into the session with this feeling of anticipation and not knowing what. So, so Randy, what you said, things happen that are beyond anything I could possibly imagine with my own thinking mind or my own distortions, that it's the invitation to do what we do, the invitation to come into that heart-centered awareness and really open to the energies, not just of my own capabilities, but of the, the actual, the Tao, I think in a way, it's like every session I begin by saying, okay, I'm gonna lean back into that greater uh, flow of life force and then watch and see what happens but the but the healing i think no matter how much suffering is going on or what level of loss or pain illness anyone brings into the treatment room the shift begins with this this opening of connection between me and that other just like what happened when we came together here and so it's a field i think that there's a field dynamic that's greater than me and greater than that other person but that couldn't constellate without us both being together you know i couldn't have clicked back into ah right the geometry of my heart-centered awareness as i I mean, I might be able to do it alone, but it sure happens faster when there's this enlivened field. And I think that's the essence of what I call the alchemical work I do, is that enlivened field over time becomes a part of the other person as well. And then, you know, it's not me doing the healing. It's, it's us doing the healing and ultimately that they get to take that with them into their life and their relationships. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could not do what I do if it was just me. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly do it for over 40 years and <laughs> see all those people and still be like, oh yeah, I really love what I do, you know, because it's not just me. Yeah, and, you know, it occurs to me that you know, there's the, this question arises of like, well, okay, well, in that in that shared space, what is it that's opening? 
Yeah. And, and there's many things that are opening, of course, but one thing that I, I want to speak to here is that there's an opening of maybe we call them soul forces, some, some dimension of being that never, ever, ever, ever has a problem with leaning into pain that never has a problem with leaning into life circumstances, um, whether it be one's own physical illnesses or the loss of a loved one or a difficult conversation. And that there's this possibility in healing where we open to this place in us that's only ever curious and loving and then have that turn towards whatever struggles we're encountering, which flips, you know, some, it really flips illness on its head, which very often in the modern world is about getting rid of it. And of course, you know, we, there's a place where there's, you know, if you broke your arm, you know, do something to help get rid of that. Like, yes, there's, there's value in that disposition and that orientation and the tools that arise from, from that orientation. But for me, almost everything I do is living in the light of my father dying before I expected him to which brought me face to face and continues to bring me face to face with life is delicate. It may not last very long. So what's the most important thing that we could be doing at any given moment. Yeah. And yeah. what I find in the treatment room, holding those same kinds of um, holding that in the treatment room and working with people, there's always issues that are the presenting issues but then there's always something else that may matter most while we care for those presenting issues. And that may be something around, we are here to learn deeply and to discover who we are, not just as individuals, but as together -olds. <laughs> to discover who we really are and, and how we can evolve together and it's those soul forces that um, are capable of doing that even when we're in the presence of considerable pain, agony, horror, whatever that might be. It's those forces to me that are the healing forces because they let us lean in and, and be ready to learn without flinching while the rest of us is flinching. Mm -hmm. I love um, what you said, uh, Alexander, and it's really a kind of a central theme for me is that it's what we want to throw away or get rid of or excise. That's like the coal, you know, that's what I call the prima materia in alchemy. It's the junk, the stuff the you know, when they describe it in the alchemical text, they say it's the piss and the urine and the, you know, the garbage that we would just want to give me a pill. Let me get rid of this, where the most incredible blossoming can happen. Now, again, like you said, on a physical level, if I've got a broken leg or I've got an appendicitis, I do, I, I'm going to say, yeah, fix me. <laughs> but when it comes to the soul and it comes to the, to our psychological, you know, why we embody that fix me attitude generally not only doesn't work, but it impedes, you know, the why we embody. You know, this development, and I, I love what you said, that there's a part of us that comes here to not turn away. And bringing all this back, Aviv, to what you said at the very beginning, because I was, I loved how you framed this meta illness, like the meta healing, 
which is our shifting capacity to organize consciousness and awareness in in skillful ways you know that there's that we are in a process right now of of a kind of planetary illness which is our the, the our degrading no longer efficient consciousness structure and truly to me that is the greatest suffering it 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 infuses everything it infuses medicine it infuses politics it infuses economics it infuses our culture so that we're all having that illness which is the illness of a a, a way of organizing reality that might have once been useful 500 years ago to thousand years ago, but is is no longer um, offering solutions or ways of living that are skillful and care, compassionate and integrated, right? So we are all, every human on this planet is suffering from that illness. So and that's Lonnie Jarrett's one of, <laughs> I brought him in. <laughs> yeah, so Lonnie's famous line: "Consciousness is the medicine." Indeed. So um, Lonnie is, is joining us, and uh, as as uh, Lonnie is able to uh, connect on camera and on sound, so so we started with exploring what is it that you are describing as the condition of disease and the heralding of illness. And then we started to open the path to that sense of healing. What is healing? Where is it coming from? How is it appearing and manifesting? And you are describing, uh, Laurie, the sense that healing occurs inside a certain my language would be symphonic arrangement. You, you describe a certain field that accelerates the, the appearance, the, the process of healing. And Alexander, you, you started to describe the, those dimensions that are forever resilient and resourceful and, and would not shy away from, but rather become more fully present and alert in the presence of pain or whatever the condition is. So Rondine, what, uh, what is coming alive for you when we try to sense where is healing coming from, where is healing arising and how do we attune ourselves to the process of healing? Mm, beautiful question. <laughs> And such beautiful openings have been created through this dialogue. And so where does healing come from? I, you know, I'm really struck with this, uh, this sense of our vastness, that we are multidimensional beings and we're on a continuum that, that coexists in other realities. It's not just the manifestation of the materiality here. And I know from my own experience that what opens me up to that is my own brokenness, my own flaws, the ways that I can't seem to access the healing that I want, that I can't seem to manipulate the world and reality to become this image of what I'd like it to be. So all I can do is surrender and say, I don't know how to overcome this. And I need to open up and say, I need help. I need to go to a larger field than the one that I can master myself. And then like Lori was saying, this connection that we have, like just the immediacy of that, tuning into that, all of a sudden brings me into this place where 
I know that my individual part, my own pain, my own unhealedness, my own brokenness, my own insufficiency contributes to that which shows up on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. But all I have is to do my own healing work, my own alchemy. And as Alexandra said, to, you know, tune into that brokenness, to, you know, polish my own rough coal and to know that I will never achieve this thing that is called healed. Mm -hmm. But it's an ongoing process because I'm not separate. I'm not limited to myself. But I, I create the field as well as I'm being subject to that field. So it's this infinite process of giving and receiving and giving and receiving and giving and receiving. It is very humbling i mean i have the image of like you know being prostrate so that the healing power of the Tao can come through and so to me it has a lot to do with um the acknowledgement of our brokenness surrendering to that inviting our patients to do that because we have done it ourselves and that does seem to open up this dimension that I don't have power over, I don't have control over, but I can humbly be in the place where it miraculously comes through and does what it needs to. And it shifts things of its own accord. And all I can do is just bow to it and like, ah, I have a great opportunity to be, be in this field where healing happens. So Lonnie, um, you're now with us and we, we traveled a little bit through what is illness and disease and, and are now emerging into the, the broader appreciation and, and attunement to uh, what is healing, where is healing emerging from. So what, what is, to, by way of bringing your voice to the conversation, please. Yeah, so in... in knowing I was going to be on this call and thinking about it. And I hope this isn't out of context because I just caught the end of what Randine was saying. Just, just in my own journey and my own contemplation of it and my own experiences clinically and in my own life, I, I started out with the idea of healing and going into a healing profession. And I think when we talk about healing, it's really a concept very much applied to the body, which is that I cut myself shaving and it takes two weeks for the wound to heal, or I broke my leg and it takes six months for it to heal. And the, the notion of healing in that regard, in the physical realm and in the gross dimension of being is that something's gonna get back to like it was you know, something, and it's going to be out of the way and it won't be a convenient inconvenience and it will be resolved. And just over the course of my life, I don't, I, healing is only a, healing has really changed to evolution and the soul's view of just a very deep time process. And it's not about getting to some place where, the wounds are gone, the scars are gone, the, the pain is gone and resolved from the past or something is back to like it was before something happened. But seeing it all as a very deep time ongoing process, not of getting over something or of having something restored, but of becoming more of going further of stepping into an unknown and ju just pushing deeper and, and further and higher into this, in, into a place that this soul hasn't been before, into, into a place that's new. Hmm. And, and so at some point, I think, think for me it stopped being about healing I, th I think this notion of healing 
in the way we use it maybe came with the advent of the postmodernism in the 60s and the new age movement in the 70s and human beings gaining the capacity to deeply introspect, awaken to the collective interior and start having a relationship to it and applying familiar concepts from the body to the more subtle realms. But I, I think that, um, yeah, at any rate for me, it's it's very much about this deep time process. And look, I'm 65, I'll be turning 66 soon. My body has issues that aren't gonna get better in this lifetime. <laughs> but 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 when i look ahead i mean my experience is a shift from the body commensurate with the shift from healing to evolution a shift from my identification with the body and recognizing the body as issues which actually they're only going to get worse and i'm going to die <laughs> <laughs> going to kill me <laughs> and, and i'm doing what i can to maintain the body in a healthful way but there's not an emphasis on i don't think about it as healing anymore i think about it as creation and investigation into a mystery and of finding of, of stepping into an unknown and in, in just a more whole more complete way I love, I love, um, I, I love that distinction around healing often being, whether we're thinking about it consciously or unconsciously as a returning back to something sort of like, oh, well, I, I had a big trauma in my life. And so if I heal, then I'll be the person I was before the trauma. And, and it brings up for me how, you know, often in the West, we, we think of ourselves as nouns. We think of ourselves as like these fixed things that that kind of, you know, get broken and then we have to like patch back together. Whereas in the East, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of um, invitation to explore ourselves as more like a verb. And when we do that, it, it, it invites this notion that every moment is receiving the previous moments and then creating something new. And then I'm now in this moment and in this moment I'm receiving all of the previous moments. And so all of us are, are receiving the last, you know, 14 billion years. It's they're pouring in right. to this moment and then saying, okay, and then what? You know, with all of those as our seeds, as our ground for this moment's exploration, what now? And if we hold that in the context of a life that has had illness, that has had traumatic experiences, that it has had pain and suffering and all those things, healing really if it were about going back to before that means we'd be cutting off all of the possibilities it's 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 like burning the seeds you know and and what i hear lani inviting is this notion that well to me a, a healthy disposition would never look back and say well i wish that never happened because the thing that has happened the things that have happened are the ground for the, the next sort of explosion of this moment's learning process. So I hear that there is, there is healing as the sense of reclaiming functional capacity. There is healing as releasing and liberating from what was perhaps preventing or arresting possibility there is healing as reintegration. I spoke with a friend uh, a couple of days ago who went through um, an open heart surgery because there was a genetic condition where there was instead of three valves, two valves, and that needed fixing. And he is describing the extraordinary process that, that he is in as reintegration. Practically, the heart and the lungs needed to reintegrate into the process after the, they were offline during the open heart surgery and how he is, his entire process of recovery is a form of reintegration. So there is healing as reintegration. There is, there is healing as coming into the optimal capacity and 
uh, resource available right here, right now, in, in this moment. And then I hear the, the, the other dimensions of healing, the, the sense of discovering purpose and meaning and being joined to something bigger than oneself. The, the healing is the connecting to the field and belonging within, finding a belonging within that greater thing. All the way to perhaps healing is realizing truth and Alexander you spoke about emerging into wholeness and Lonnie you speak about transcending what we have known as healing into the process of evolution so it strikes me that there are those different dimensions and, and gradients of, of um, the larger domain of healing so I'm, I'm curious what else comes alive for you about the way you experience and the way you come into contact, the way you source that fountain that we describe as healing or many other natures that, that we already spoke to. I want to, first of all, appreciate of you, your, the clarity of that summary. Um, I felt like you really did gather up this rather rhizomatic conversation and every single thing that you mentioned i would say yes to each of the different ways that you said we could have healing here healing could be reintegration healing could be meaning healing could be purpose every one of those has shown up somewhere in some session that i've done so it's all that mm -hmm. You know, if we say the root of the word is wholeness, is holy, it shares roots with those words. Some, so we're saying integration, being more of who I could be, recovering my spiritual connections, all that. But you know, what's really, because my first sort of pebble was polishing the coal so it could become a diamond or as it becomes a diamond, I come back to that because, and I think Lonnie, you brought me back to that because this idea that ultimately in all those things that we're mentioning and all those ways that healing happens in our treatment room or in a community, that if we say, somehow consciousness is the medicine. And that's what I had just said, Lonnie, quoting you when you pop, when your picture popped up. That what's becoming palpable to me, especially if we say it's happening in the moment, in the moment, is this transparency that begins to become available you know that the diamond the the clarity of the diamond as opposed to the opacity of the coal not that one is necessarily better than the other they're in relationship but it's this capacity to see through so that my story and my scars and my suffering it's not that they go away but I'm, I'm seeing through them in a certain way. They become, well, I get Gebser's word that there becomes a diaphaneity to the world. And I see, and I begin to be in this moment, aware of the light that is streaming from all of your hearts from, you know, I'm, as soon as I saw you, as soon as I see, you know, that you bring away this kind of awareness or presencing, you know, I become aware that this is light, that we're really just in this diaphanous universe. And that, um, that all of the suffering that really is beyond imagining that's happening on the planet right now. that we can still see through it to something 
that is that is shining through that wants to be seen and that as we see it that's when the healing can begin yeah i i think it from that Lori, it's it's this sense of timelessness mm. right. relative to the any particular experience right. that, that i might be having yes so one of the issues with healing is the word healing gives the sense of there's something that has to be done before i'm getting ready to be ready and when i'm healed i'll be ready but i'm not ready yet and there's something that really changes from i mean i understand it in recent years in the context of just the bodhisattva vow which, which is that as healers, we're here to respond to everything in a way that moves whatever is toward the true, the good, the beautiful. And there's nothing ever in the way of that. And it doesn't take time. Even if experience is unpleasant or difficult, I understand that, that who and what I am is the, the commitment toward and the, the impulse toward responding in a way that moves things right, that acknowledges wholeness and moves them toward greater wholeness now without having to say time out. If my, I break my leg and my leg has to heal, I can't ride a bike till it's healed. But on this, on the soul level, there's just an ongoing commitment that no matter what, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop and there's nothing in the way. And there never could be anything in the way. Yeah. And it's the, it's those dark, those aspects that we don't want to deal with, that we wish we wouldn't have. The, you know, I'm, I'm so struck every time I, Alexander shares about the tragedy of his life, not, not in a way like, well, when I healed from my father's murder, but opening it up in a way that, that the healing is the exposure that, you know, when my, my brother died, I, I don't want to get to a place where I no longer live in the sadness of that. I mean, it doesn't take me over anymore. But I want to be able to, like, in opening up what might be perceived as a negative, then everybody who has lost a loved one through some sort of traumatic tragedy, as I open that up, the healing happens for everybody that has ever lost a loved one through tragedy. And, and there seems to be like the courage of the soul is to grow and expand and to heal more. And if it seems to, the, I get to the point where, you know, I've done all my work, which I never have, I will never <laughs> claim, but, but then it seems like the collective comes through, that just mm -hmm. being able to be open to the places where the wounds still live, where the dis-ease still is, that healing is this ongoing process of continuing to open greater. And let's not get to the place where we say, my trauma is healed, I have no more sadness, but like to, to continue to lean into it, to continue to say, like, I, I sometimes have a little issue with like, okay, trauma is a big catch word right now and everybody wants to overcome their trauma. And I'm saying, but why? why it, it, the greatest trauma is that we feel separate and if i feel like i've done the work i have no more trauma then where's my access point to the all that is experiencing the trauma of separation and the loss of unity so i love the discussion about we move from this idea of healing the wounds into this evolutionary process where something greater than us connects us, unites us, and heals in a way where we're not trying to patch up and scar and overcome. But it kind of keeps it out in the open. Yeah. I love what you're saying. And, you know, it occurs to me that it's like 
I mean, imagine, you know, my dad was killed 27, just the anniversary was just this Sunday, it was 27 years, and I, it's, I'm still learning from, from that one event. In fact, a lot of what I've learned has come from that one event. And so the, the willingness, it's, you know, and, and we could look at it like traumas, but we could also look at it like, like those seeds I was talking about, the seeds that keep pouring into the present moment. And if we don't tend them, they still pour into the present moment, but they just do so in hiding and they inform our behavior in, in, in ways that cause harm to self and other. But when we, when we allow things to be diaphanous and see through to the scary places and feel those, those, those agonist roars inside of us, it's, this, it's seed tending. It's seed tending. And then there's these sort of these sprouts that continue to, to occur that have these blossoms and these fruits that we just couldn't have fathomed would be there. And so it's like, you know, I think I think part of it is is this notion of burden that when we feel our pain or our traumas as burden it can have the feature of obscuring unless we're already connected to our soul it can have this feature of obscuring and making life kind of appear fragmented and warped in all these ways but but it but with that intention to bring this the soul to a process of tending, those burdens get liberated. We still can feel the pain of loss and we can still feel even more of the human sort of panoply of sensations and emotions and thoughts and all those kinds of things. But, but now it's no longer a burden, it's a gift. It's a gift. When you describe uh, Randy in that sense of uh, not needing to uh, try to overcome trauma such that it, it is left in, in the past, where it took me, that awareness. I, I live in the US and at the same time have many friends and family in Israel. We're now, as we record this, a uh, little more than four months after October 7 and the events of that day and the as I listen to how the conversation evolved over the last uh, several months, one of the, at this point, the recurring theme is you have a whole young generation of people who they clearly understand that they will live for the rest of their life in the echo and the shadow and, and the, the, the byproducts of... Uh, these eventful moments, these, this eventful day and, and whatever happened since. And a lot of the people who, who speak to that will say we never had a, even the time to begin to process our grief, to begin to process our shock. And I can speak to that because uh, to what I'm going to say next, uh, my father is escaped the Holocaust. He's um, parents and three of his brothers and sisters were, went down in Auschwitz. That was a generation that never really processed what they experienced. That was the generation that marched on with, we will build a new country, we will build a new world, and that will be our revenge and our salvation. The, the, the switching on of the interior through the 50s, more 60s, 70s, and the turning of the light on the inside appeared for that generation, my father's generations, very late in life. So he had a, a late stage in life grief about what he has experienced earlier. The, the interesting thing how Israel is so, uh, this is something I, I can speak to, I have the right to speak to, uh, always protected the Nobody else can compare or, or use the, the term Holocaust. It, it's preserved only for one event in time. But people have spoken about what has happened on October 7 as a, as a Holocaust experience. And what I am 
sensing into in, in the bigger ecology of our conversation is that's a fractal of, of an event that will likely chain react and have its manifestation in other ways, in other places around the world in, in coming years. And what I mean by that is the unthinkable can happen. The degree of pain and torment and horror is so much larger than the capacity to, of normal, regular people to metabolize. And now I'm bringing it back to us, how do we, with all that you know in practice, what is it that we can bring to the table? As you said, not to change what happened, not to get rid of what happened, not to forget, not to create a separation from that, but to help the, the flow of life metabolize in the most robust and vivid and full way the fullness of the potential of what's emerging now such that we are not separated from the life that flows with us today. That's the inquiry that's alive with me into where is healing. I, I think, um, I mean, look, what you just said, we could like, like take 12 hours now. <laughs> it's, it's very deep and, and there's a lot in it. But so, you know, I mean, I'm Jewish. My family was Jewish. My, my ancestors escaped, you know, Kiev and Chernobyl and Odessa in, in the Ukraine. And so what's going on in the Ukraine and what's going on in Israel, of course, bring, brings a lot up for me. But I, I think the key, in, the key in, in this to me, so first of all, the Bodhisattva vow, of course, extols us, may I be the doctor and the medicine. So we're talking here as physicians but we're also talking as patients, right? We're, we're, we're looking at both things. And to me, the context, the soul's, con the soul's context, not the ego's view on the kind of very deep issue you brought up, but the soul's view is this isn't, this is, this isn't just about me. And it's not even maybe most significantly about me and all the emotions I'm having and everything I'm feeling. And it's not just about my family. It's about the, the big context here is on the soul's journey of these two people who have really been in battle for 4,000 years, these two peoples, is how can I hold the whole thing and how can I respond in the right way for the greatest good with the commitment that the karmic line ends with me. The karmic line ends here. Like when I make a different choice, when I make a different choice, it has the potential to change everything, not just for myself, but for culture as a whole. So I can say when the whole thing happened on October 7th, which I still feel the reverberations of, very deeply, even though I've never been to Israel and and wasn't raised particularly religious, but there's still a sort of an ancestral resonance of of the whole thing through me. And I I just sort of took the position that I was happy to see Joe Biden take, which was this this is your September 11th. Don't just react. You have an opportunity here. And that, uh, and of course, Netanyahu is not capable of that, and wasn't capable of that, and and just his soul is not evolved enough to have been. But I think many of us saw the potential of do something that's com don't respond the way they want you to respond. Do something completely different. And so the context is from a, out of a care for a greater whole is that in the face of great pain, in the face of great adversity, in the face of when all the conditioning is arising and all the shadow is triggered, to be able to know it, step back, take a breath and say, okay, everything in me wants to do this. And if I do that, it's just going to create, it's just going to be another brick in the wall of the same pattern. 
what can I do that's uniquely creative that I've never done before, that nobody's ever done before? How can I respond in a way that that's new, that has the potential to catalyze the emergence of something that's never been? And this is the shift from healing to evolution because we're not trying to get back to something or, or to someone we were before something happened. We're trying to, to be a human that's never existed before, except in the imagination. So I, I would love to respond or speak to Lonnie what you just said. Um, as when the conversation went in this direction, I was aware that I couldn't stay in the field. I, I disassociated. Um, I'm back. Um, as you said, Lonnie, there's so, we just opened a conversation that <laughs> is so vast. But to attempt to speak to, to bring it back within the, the parameters here, um, what we're speaking to is the difference between our ideas about how healing or evolution can happen and the autonomic neurological postal responses to survival threats. I'm very close connection to, um, I'm going to say a group of people who are seriously engaged in prayer and um, ongoing meditation on the situation in Israel, Palestine. Right now, it's, it's deeply, deeply in my cellular. I have been several times. I know that land. What I want to say is that in the moment on October 7th, the opportunity Lonnie, that you're speaking to, that we, that we actually begin to be able to have diaphaneity, a transparency into the autonomic responses. So the teaching that I do ongoing with all my students and every practitioner I work with and everyone who studies with me is what I have simply called the pause practice. And it's Lonnie, what you're speaking to, and a, a very, very dear friend of mine who's engaged in this issue, has deep roots in Israel, um, said, what if we had simply paused? And in that pause, to me, anyway, that's the space where healing can happen. Mm. And when we don't, if we don't have the capacity for that pausing, then all, like what you're saying, Alexander, all the seeds, all the survival drives, all the old ways that our organisms have sought to perpetuate themselves, will kick in. And this is so close to me right now because when I was actually in Mexico, I'm a passionate ocean going swimmer. And I actually had a confront with the Pacific just last week where um, I had one of those wonderful NDEs, you know, I basically was, I would have died. The ocean had decided to really, like we had this moment and my, my body, what I was aware of, and I, as you can see, did not, um, 
my husband actually dove into the riptide. <laughs> but when I got to the beach, I, I was lying with these waves coming up and all my students were standing around me and I puked on them. <laughs> I threw <laughs> up on my own students. <laughs> but the point is what I was aware of and what I am grappling with was my body's response to survive. You know, they're so beginning to learn to pause. So I'm really reflecting on how do we do this that we're talking about, not react, you know, actually living into those moments when our lives are which was happening, you know, peep, how do we respond differently? How do we learn to pause? How do we learn to, to open to a different relationship to life death threat? So that's my current, definitely my current inner work right now. My day on is wow, that was an incredible learning. Wow. And so I'm bringing it back to this question of, you know, what would have happened on October 7th if everyone, Palestinian, Israeli, everyone could have said, we don't have to do the same thing again. Wow, Lori. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you, everybody. And here we have that pause. Here we're given an opportunity to pause. And in that pause, which is beyond right doing and wrong doing, it's also beyond life and death as polar opposites. That in that pause, we are in, the, in this space where something else can come through when we're not caught up in our opinions about maybe I shouldn't have swam so far or October 7th shouldn't have happened or this is what we could have done or this is what should have been done. But right there, surrendering into the pause, something else can come through. And I have to trust that there is a goodness of the universe, that Tao is good, humanity is good. And a goodness comes through because I don't know the difference all the time between what's right and what's wrong. And when I'm in that place, then something beyond comes through. And I have hope for that. Not the hope in a better future per se, but the hope that's alive right now in that pause. Like that's in the bardo, that's in the place of the unknown between life and death. That there's still goodness that does not end when life ends. Yeah, I think that... Um... Yeah, when you say trust in the goodness of the universe, the the way, you know, the way I think about that is, or it is just a fun having come to a fundamental recognition of trust in the overall goodness of the process. I mean, the universe is a crazy place. Huh. <laughs> there's, there's there's a lot of chaos that goes on in the universe and good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people so i mean at at sort of you know an early stage of it there's sort of um yeah i mean i i, I just think where i've come to is just the fundamental stopping fighting and working with what is and assuming that whatever is and responding to whatever is as it is in a way that makes things more whole. I mean, you know, when Alexander says much of whom I've become in my life and who I am is, and what I've learned is a result of this thing that happened to my father. Well, actually it's a result of the choices Alexander made in relationship 
to what happened to his father. And, and that comes, you know, this is one of the reasons I, one of the reasons other than my actual lived experience of, of the sense of soul and myself and in things and in people is just the recognition that 999 people out of a thousand this happened to would have responded in a different way. And there's something relative to where Alexander's soul has come to where all those previous less than his current response responses have been transcended. And, and the real commitment is this fundamental trust of this thing happened and I'm, I'm gonna turn this into gold for myself and for everyone. And I'm gonna do the thing that hasn't been done. That's right. And, it, and as I think maybe Randine had said before, I, I don't remember who spoke it, these, these moments where we make that decision to do something that someone hasn't done before or to do something that isn't the common response, it, it ripples into everywhere. Yes. I spoke with the man who killed my father three weeks ago for the first time. And I saw good in him and I told him that. And I asked him, what do we want to do to make this, to make something good out of this? And, and our three hour conversation, I mean, it changed the course of his life. It changed the course of my life. It changed the course of everybody that will come into contact with this story's life. And that question, which is that I asked him, what do we, what do, what, what should we do to make something beautiful out of this, out of what happened those many years ago? That's another way of asking that question. How do, how do we do something that's unexpected? Mm -hmm. And he's bringing that to his prison, which is a tough prison. But he's talking to people. And some people aren't going to listen. And some people aren't going to listen right away. But this is the thing about seeds. You know, they don't always sprout right away. And we just don't know what will take root in the depth of another human being. And maybe it's one of those kinds of seeds that like, lays dormant for 10 more years or 20 more years or 30 more years. And then something starts to gnaw, something, something budding and beautiful starts to gnaw at them from the inside. Like, wait a minute, there's another possibility than what I've been choosing. And that's why I think that pause and those unexpected choices that we make matter so much because it, it's really not about us as, an, as one individual person. I mean, it is in part, you know, we, we want to try to make it through this life, you know, but, but I think more than that, it really has a, it has such a broad implications about what that kind of pause and, and those kinds of choice makings um, have on our lives and, and everybody around us. What, what did you feel, Alexander, that occurred in you? through this conversation and at the other end of the conversation, what, how, how were you different at the end of the conversation? I think one of the main ways that I was different, I've, I've had a silent relationship with a man I never met for 27 years. And I would have told you, I know he's good and I've spent time doing you know, compassion practices with him and holding his heart and doing all these things that we do when the subtle realms are a part of our daily practice. But it's another thing to sit across from the person and to see them shed tears and to see their goodness and to see that no one's ever seen their goodness and, and to see it happen for real in the concrete world. Um was so striking to see how, 
you know, Lonnie mentioned, um, you know, some of the things that I had been speaking about came from the choices that I made in relationship to losing my father. And I've had a really privileged life with surrounded by people that love me and want to help me and teachers like everybody here that has helped guide me and, and open me to things. And then you have, have someone like Herbert who grew up in the most, that's the name of the, the man, um, that grew up in an environment that was so violent, we, we, we could hardly even imagine it. And he was so violent for the first decade or more in prison. It earned him a dark red jumpsuit, which means be careful. This man is someone to be careful of. And now he meditates in his cell. And he taught himself how to read. And when I told him that my dad was a, a meditator and tried to help people, he was like, that's like me. When you're describing your dad, that's like me. That's like you. We're all connected. Now, those words in maybe the, the folks that are interested in listening to something like what we're doing right here, we might say we're connected just you know for breakfast. Like That's just a common thing we'd say. But how did the grace of the goodness of the soul make its way into a violent prison, into awakening inside of someone who had a child? I mean, he saw his first murder at 12. His idea of a successful life was making it to 16. And yet something is waking up in him. Mm -hmm. For decades, not just from our call. They <laughs> long before we made contact. And so to me, what stands out is I've been telling people that the universe is good and that human beings are good for a long time. But this is another level of proof. Yeah. Yeah. So in in some way by by creating out of your own space a space for him to birth himself in you with you you are offering yourself a, a rebirthing process by giving him that that permission that um, possibility a rebirthing for everybody who wants to encounter what's possible. Laurie, I'm left with your experience in the ocean because the ocean is one of my best friends ever. I just came back from my swim in the ocean. Every day I go to the ocean and the lifeguards know that I ask, how is she? That's Dr. Ocean. I call her Dr. Ocean. The and any day, the Dr. Ocean, Dr. Ocean is beautiful every day, even if it's a stormy day. And I'm one of those, oh, where, wherever I swim, I'm the only one daring to dive in in a stormy, riptide ocean. So I'm still left with the, with the resonance of what you described as, as your experience. Have you come out of that separated, uh, traumatized by the ocean, or, or more fully ready to embrace it in, in, in you? I'm um, more in love with her. It took me, let me see, the next morning, <laughs> I was tentative, but I, I'm back. Um, there's no way that I would be separated from the water. Uh, yeah, I swim in very cold water in Maine as much as I can where we live. But and I feel like like you, Alexander, that I was given a gift. I mean, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply grateful that I could come back with Benjamin. He was like, I'm really glad I'm not coming back alone. <laughs> we're, you know, we're incredibly grateful. It was an amazing experience, but the, but the gift 
of the experience certainly is there's no way I'm staying away from her, but the gift is that moment of encounter with the survival response in my own body, because we had just had our conversation on death very recently. And together we're working with this, this heart opening dissolution, shattering opening to the love that comes when we, when we open to death. And yet when it was happening, my autonomic response was, was a resistance to dying. Hmm. The, my body kicked in, you know, the ocean water came out of me, my, you know, breath norm, it was, that was the business of that moment. And so I'm really, what the gift and the invitation is to continue to work with what we call in Chinese medicine, the, the po soul, the body soul, and begin to um, familiarize the body soul with mm. these ex with the death experience because you know like you say Lonnie it every day that reality comes closer as a friend as a companion and yet a companion I got to know I don't know so well yet still have a lot of familiarizing myself with but no the ocean and I were we're continuing our journey together. Yeah. <laughs> that is so powerful. Thank you, Lori. So glad that you're still here, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, every, I'm like, oh, you're here. How wonderful. But in a way, you know, coming back to our original question, isn't this healing, you know? Yeah. Like the, the ultimate healing can be encountering death, encountering yeah. death and that, you know, the fragility of life and that, you know, yes. that idea of the deathless becomes a reality through, you know, that recognition of the potency of the posed desire to survive yes. and stay alive. And As a that, dance in a way, yes. Yes, and the rebirth yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, like you you are rebirthed out of that experience. Yeah. So we're probably approaching a, a uh, closing round or, or towards the end of uh, this uh, weave. What, what is most alive for me is, is the, the opening the pause, the rebirthing in the face of death, the evolution that becomes available in every moment, the fact that so much is seeking through us to, to um, make entry into this we are portals to the universe and the universe breathes through us. So this is what I am gathering in myself uh, through this conversation and, and uh, especially your, your presence, each of your presence uh, and the gifts you offered. So I, I wonder if there are any, any other words in anybody to well. speak to this, please. Yeah, I would just say one one thought I wanted to bring to the conversation about healing, which I mean is related to what we've been talking about, but I mean, most directly related, I think, to that sense of timelessness we were talking about earlier and the imperative to act now is really there are there are two ways of practicing medicine, bottom up and top down. And the bottom-up way is most pervasive, and it's the patient comes in and tells us all these things they want to accomplish and all these things they need to do. And we use medicine to help get them to the point of eventually doing these things. And I, having been in practice now 
39 years, there were people who it took 17 or 18 or 22 years to get them to actually do the thing that we talked about the first day they came in. So I think that's a very average way that people in healing professions work is, is to ascertain a person's goals and help them work toward doing it. And what has always been more interesting to me is the top-down approach of just taking time out of the picture, which is rather than using medicine to get a person to a point of doing what they know they should be doing and stopping doing what they know they shouldn't be doing, having them just start and stop and use medicine to deal with the consequences of having done the right thing. And that just makes everything immediate because the second a person says, okay, I'm, go I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna do it or I'm not gonna do it. And I'm putting my stake in the ground and the karmic line ends now, then instantly all the forces that support the evolution of their soul toward the true, the good, the beautiful, toward this wholesome step line up and, and every force inside that wants to maintain the status quo and has no sincerity at all in engaging with healing also becomes perfectly clear. And then we really have something we can work with as opposed to just spending, you know, years and years getting ready to be ready, actually doing it and then using medicine to deal with the consequences. And I've, and that's for me, what in this relatively small percentage of patients who will do it shifts the whole orientation from healing to evolution. And it doesn't, and that doesn't have to take time. It just takes a choice. And the second the choice is made, all of a sudden you're, you're stepped through a portal and the whole conversation is totally different about why we're here, what we're doing together, what the process is. It completely changes the instant that choice is made. So it's like with Alexander, I don't know how he thinks about his process because we've never talked about it, but I would say, I would surmise, we could, we could say hypothetically he had all these choices, but I'd say where things have come to was actually a choiceless choice that started instantly. Even if it took this long to talk to the man and, but everything between the moment of finding out about his father's death and, and now that, that path, the, the origin, the goal has been present through the whole thing and was there this in Alexander's deepest heart, the second in, in the momentary response, even if the autonomic nervous system and the ego went into shock, which, which is what they would do, which is what they would do, but there was still this, this deeper level that at some, at, in, at some place in his heart, Alexander knew was there. And I'll be so bold to add that in the soul of Alexander, he was born for that moment. And I think we're all born for the moment of our deepest healing and our deepest challenges. Uh -huh. I, I do feel called just to say one more piece here to that it's a both and as far as time and timelessness that both are happening and I bring that back to this notion of shifting consciousness the larger meta healing of the planet because there's this sense that this movement that you spoke to at the very beginning of Eve, that we're in this sort of meta crisis time where the old way of organizing reality 
and some completely new way, like we're talking about never before manifested on this planet, we're in, we're in the riptide in a sense. And we don't know whether we're going to survive this transformation or not as a, in this dimension. I mean, I firmly believe that we are working multidimensionally to um, erupt an integral awareness, but whether it happens here in this dimension or not, we do not know. We're in a riptide. And, you know, for a long time, it's like, when is it going to happen? When is it? When are human beings going to wake up? When are they going to stop? When are they? And then finally, I got that it it's right now. Like, we just did it. It's now. The integral is happening right here right now on Zoom, like the five of us. And yet it's also this, these seeds that you spoke of, Alexander, that we have to keep cultivating and cultivating and cultivating that may take not just 30 years, it may take 30,000 years, but it doesn't matter because it's also happening now, right now. Beautiful. Um, for for my final words, I'd love to just read um, a short thing that is a part of the book I've been writing. I think it 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 fits. These are the threshold moments, the fiery hoops through which we must leap like hesitant lions, and accept the alchemical refashioning of everything we thought we were. The music of existence rings from the withins of things and carries us through the doors that annihilate whatever remains of separation's fable. To die to the mythological beast of broken wings has agony embedded within its dissolution, and dissolution is rarely instantaneous. With all those shavings, heavy weights, and bits of flesh requiring divine mastication, we find ourselves weeping many trembling tears as we tumble and fumble through doors that evolution may purr her way along, making us whole. That's good writing, Alexander. Thanks, <laughs> thank you, Alexander. And, and thank you all. Um, really instantaneous, and yet at the same time, as Lonnie said, everything can happen right here, right now, in this moment. Every everything is happening right here, right? Everything now. is happening right now. Especially when we especially when we don't resist the riptide, but flow with the riptide and actually let ourselves come out the other side. <laughs> Thank you. When, when Lori was talking, I thought to myself, have I had a near-death experience? And my next thought was, Oh, I'm I'm actually having one right now. <laughs> 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 how, far away, how far away is it ever? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <Beautiful>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Along with our website at portalsofperception.org. Portals is also available on YouTube and on all podcast platforms, as well as social media. You can become an active member and join the conversation in community events. And you can help us get the word out by liking this content and by sharing it with your friends.